Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hope you're having an amazing day. I want to kick this video off discussing a rather interesting interview which Tom's Hardware recently conducted with AMD. During this interview, a number of interesting topics were brought up concerning the performance targets of RDNA 3, power consumption, and well, basically speaking, it does seem that the performance targets, of course, for RDNA 3 are going to be pretty damn ambitious, but AMD does confirm here that the power consumption targets are also going to be up significantly despite numerous improvements in performance per watt and we'll discuss more about that in just a moment and furthermore we also get some hints as to the design officially anyway of rdna3 so let's begin by just briefly mentioning that the individual who was speaking here is Sam Nafsiga. Hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. Nafsiga is an AMD senior uh, vice president as well as a corporate fellow and product technology architect. So it's fair to say that they have a pretty good understanding as to what AMD are doing with inside the company. It's really the fundamentals of physics that are driving this, he explains. The demand for gaming and compute performances if anything, just accelerating, and at the same time, the underlying process technology is slowing down pretty dramatically in terms of the improvement rate, so the power levels are just going to keep going up. Now, we've got a multi-year roadmap of very significant efficiency improvements to offset the curve, but the trend is there. Actually, I have to say that their technology headwinds roadmap actually, well, sorry, um, a slide actually really kind of illustrates this. Um, we're going to get more into this in just a moment, but yeah. Um, long story short, of course, you know, node introduction rate, as at least AMD are showing here, slowed down pretty significantly, which means that not only do you need to be smarter in terms of, you know, the actual design of the chips themselves, but you need to incorporate different technologies such as chiplets and so on. But there is, well, still the inevitability that power figures are going to start going up. Performance is king, stated Nefsiga, but even if our designs are more power efficient, that doesn't mean you don't push lower levels up if the competition is doing the same thing. It's just that they'll have to push them up a lot higher than we will. Now this possibly does indicate that AMD are confirming here that RTX 40 is going to indeed have higher power consumption than what Navi 31, 32, and 33 will have. We've already seen quite a lot of leaks, of course, with this, and I've discussed them numerous times. Basically speaking, to my understanding thus far, and of course this is not official, but N31 is 375 watts up to 450. I have heard of a very outside possibility that it could be 500 watts, but honestly that was an outlier. Pretty much all of my sources at this stage have told me 450 watts for custom AIB models, which is much lower than the, you know, the outlier cards for NVIDIA. So it seems like anyway the RTX 1490 Ti could be 600 watts or more. Honestly, the figures for NVIDIA just, there are so many different power consumption figures and I suspect one of the reasons for this is just that NVIDIA are still trying to actually ascertain what, you know, what they really feel that they can get away with quote unquote in the market. Now, also, a very interesting slide that if you go back and look at is RDNA 2's performance per watt. It was actually a 50% improvement despite utilizing the same 7nm node as RDNA 1. Now, AMD managed to achieve this with a plethora of tactics, and you can see what they are on screen yourself in the slide. I'm not going to go through all of them, but basically things like designing, sorry, uh, design uh, frequency increases, they basically utilize um, things like the infinity cache and so on and so on. Basically speaking, they were very smart in their decision. Now, officially speaking, RDNA 3 improves performance per watt by up to 50%. I have heard a rumor from a single source that this is the worst case scenario and is based on Narve 33, which is on a 6nm process, but of course, 5nm is allegedly going to be uh, N31 and 32 for the GCD, but uh, 6NM process for the uh, MCD. But I'm going to still take the official number from AMD and say that it's a 50% uh, improvement performance per watt. During the same interview, AMD did also kind of provide a lot of hints that they were going with a chiplet-based design, which isn't exactly surprising, especially what they've disclosed in the past. But um, basically... 
they have confirmed during the interview that they're not talking about HBM. So it's not going to be high bandwidth memory, and that's what they're referring to with the chiplets. But basically, there would be separate chiplets, but they didn't actually discuss exactly how those chiplets are going to function or the design itself. Now, just as a quick reminder, to my understanding anyway, with N31, it's a single GCD. You can see the specs on screen. But uh, there were some rumors that it could be two GCDs, but largely those have fallen by the wayside now. And it's going to be a single GCD and then multiple MCDs. The MCDs basically act as not only the Infinity Cache, but furthermore, they act as basically the memory controllers for the GDDR6 memory. It seems like we're looking at a 384 bit bus, but the actual Infinity Cache, I've heard two different figures 192 and 384 megabytes. But again, I really want to stress, guys, none of this is official. So, um, yeah, um, I'm just adding the end to provide a little bit of context to the interview itself. Next up, we have an i9-13900 Raptor Lake benchmark, quote-unquote, that has leaked online. This has been published by EX Preview. I say it in such a term because, well, it's not really benchmarks at this stage. It's more of like a performance preview, which they do acknowledge themselves. Um, the issue, of course, is that we are still looking at not only engineering sample silicon, but things like the BIOS is not exactly going to be in a final state. With that said, it does give us a hint as to what's to come. Now, the 13900 was actually compared against the 12900K, which again does give a small advantage to the predecessor. Now, of course, we do know that the 13900 does indeed feature additional cores, thanks to the increase in the energy efficient cores that we've discussed 100 million times at this point. Uh, I will also leave a link to a write-up from WCCF Tech, and they've done a pretty good job of just giving an overview as to the different performance scores. Now, the bottom line is that the um, 13900 does pretty well here, but obviously in some applications, the clock frequency does start to regress. However, with that said, um, some applications do definitely perform pretty well. For example, in terms of max threads, and this is not exactly surprising with the CPU uh, benchmark in 3D Mark or the CPU profile to be precise, we're looking at a 24% increase. But again, that is due to the additional cores and threads available. But in single thread results, well, it's actually a 8% deficit. And this is something that we're looking at, of course, throughout numerous tests. They also ran some very interesting tests for gaming. And these were 3.8 gigahertz fixed for both the 13900 as well as the 12900K. Now, again, even though this is the case and the clock frequency is now going to be more favorable, of course, to the 13900, we are still looking at engineering samples and very early BIOSes. And basically speaking, a game like Gears of War, for example, is margin of error difference. It's 1% slower on the 13900 but other titles for example um, something like Far Cry 6 is around 6% slower but I think that's just about it for this particular video hopefully you have enjoyed it if you did then you know what to do it's YouTube leave a like on the video and of course subscribe for more content and I'll see you soon take care of yourselves bye for now